You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. There are some moments that shake the world, even if it's not always clear at the time. Masa Amini was not the first woman, not even close, to be arrested by Iran's morality police over how she wore her hijab. But when she died in police custody, a 22-year-old full of life snuffed out, a spark was lit. Anger sweeping across the country following the death of 22-year-old Massa Amini. Women are seen leading the protests in Iran, taking off their headscarves. Schoolgirls across the country flouting the law, some uncovering their hair, many even chanting death to the dictator. Now to Iran, where the government's violent crackdown on peaceful protests is now in its 18th day. One human rights group says at least 133 people have been killed so far. Hundreds have been arrested. Sunday, security forces besieged Tehran's elite Sharif University. The mounting anti-government protests in Iran now reaching the critical oil industry. Flames and thick smoke rising overnight from the Evin prison, where hundreds of political prisoners are locked up. It's the same prison housing hundreds more arrested during the past month of street protests against Iran's hardline leadership. It has now been more than one month since Amini died, and Iran is burning, literally and figuratively. If the authorities were able to stamp this out, it would have happened by now. But the brutal actions they are taking to try and regain control aren't working, and the world is watching. What makes these protests different from others that Iran has seen over the past few decades? Why now? And what is the ultimate outcome? Freedom from state-imposed dress codes for women? Or freedom from the entire Iranian regime? Can these protests succeed? And what might the world do to help these brave women and the men supporting them take that last, final step? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Mazir Bahari is an Iranian-Canadian journalist and filmmaker. He is the editor of IranWire.com, and he is the author of Then They Came For Me, which chronicles his arrest and his 118-day imprisonment in Iran following the controversial 2009 election. Hello, Mazir. Thank you for having me. I wanted to start uh, today, especially because we're talking to you, uh, with Even Prison in Tehran. Why is that prison so notorious? It's the one that the world has seen uh, on fire, I believe. And what does it represent to protesters and the regime? Well, Even Prison uh, was built in 1972 as a high security prison in Iran during the Shah's time. So it was seven years before the Islamic Revolution. And In the beginning, it was mainly for political prisoners and armed guerrillas who were fighting against the Shah's regime. After the revolution, after February 1979 revolution, many of the people who were incarcerated in Evin prison before the revolution, they uh, took the power and they became in charge of the prison. So they knew the vulnerabilities of the prisoners. They knew what torture worked, which torture did not work. Hmm. How could they interrogate more efficiently? And as a result, the 1980s, when they arrested, jailed, tortured, and executed thousands of prisoners in Evin prison, it became notorious and it became synonymous with the theocratic rule in Iran and Ayatollah Khomeini's dictatorship. So as the regime became more, uh, let's say, solidified and became more established, Evin also became more established and became more notorious. It expanded its power. Evin has 
eight wards at the moment, and uh, I think it has the capacity of about uh, of holding about fifteen thousand prisoners. But the real number apparently is higher. We do not know exact number, but there are some estimates that there are twenty five thousand prisoners inside Ebin prison. So it's really become synonymous with the regime's brutality. It's become synonymous with torture and execution. So when they take you to Evin, as they did with me in uh, June 2009, it really sends a shiver down your spine. And you know that you're going to be intimidated. You're going to be uh, tortured and Evin is also designed to be impenetrable. So when you arrive in Evin prison, especially if you when you go to their uh, solitary confinement cells, you're denied of all your senses. Uh, the only thing that you see around you are the walls. You cannot smell anything. You cannot hear anything. And you cannot talk to anyone. So as a result, you feel really, really isolated. And that in itself is a torture. What do we know about the fire that recently broke out there? And, you know, as you mentioned, you, you spent some time in that prison as well. What was it like for yourself to, to read and see images of that, that building, which you, uh, you said is synonymous with the regime burning? So uh, the first thought that I had when I heard about the fire was not about what I went through because... I was a kind of a celebrity prisoner. People outside of the prison, people outside of Iran knew my name. There was an international campaign for my mm. release. My wife is a British citizen. So I was in a very different situation than the majority, 99.9% of the prisoners in Evin, especially the non-political prisoners in Evin who do not have anyone to campaign for them outside. And the fire that we saw last Saturday uh, happening in Evin was in ward number seven, which is for non-political prisoners. And they are mainly there for either financial uh, crimes or misdemeanors, which includes bounce checks, or for uh, more serious crimes like armed robbery or uh, murder. And apparently the new head, uh, the new warden of Evin Prison is a sadistic man who is a revolutionary guard. He was in charge of another prison before Fasha Fouye uh, prison, and he committed several atrocities in that prison. And I guess the authorities were happy with his performance and they put him in charge of Evin Prison. So... Uh, since he became the warden of Evin Prison, he started to brutalize uh, prisoners, especially non-political prisoners and the unknown prisoners. And for example, he denied them of their medicine. He forced them to do some cleaning work and things like that. So as a result, a group of prisoners revolted on Saturday and we do not know exactly what happened, but uh, there was fire. And as a result, up to now, we know that 13 people at least died. The authorities, they have admitted that four people have died and several other people have been in prison. But this morning, we talked to some of our sources in Iran, and they've told us that at least 13 uh, prisoners have been verified dead uh, as a result of that fire, and it could be more. I wanted to begin uh, with the prison because it's one of the more recent developments and also, of course, uh, because of your knowledge about it. But we also wanted to talk to you to get a sense of what's happening in Iran from somebody who, who has good visibility into what's going on there. I mean, it's now been uh, over a month since Masa Amini died in the custody of the morality police. Can you Take us back to when that happened, when when the protests first began. Did you have any idea that, you know, more than a month later, uh, they would be getting bigger and we'd still be discussing them? So on Wednesday, the 14th of September, one of my colleagues, Aida Gajar, heard that there is a woman in 
hospital in Iran because she was beaten by the morality police. And we published that story on IranWire.com on the 14th of September. Then we followed that story and we were wondering what has happened to Mahsa Amini, the 22-year-old Kurdish woman who was arrested by the morality police. And unfortunately, she died on the 16th of September. And then the protests uh, broke out on the 16th of September. And I think her death really hits a nerve among all Iranians across the country. Older Iranians or middle-aged Iranians, they could see Mahsa as their own daughter, sister, niece, cousin. She was an everyday woman. She was someone who was not political. She was not an activist. She, she was just an ordinary woman who came from a small town to Tehran to visit families. And as soon as she got out of the uh, metro station in Tehran, she was arrested by the morality police. Her brother objected to the arrest, but they took her to the, to the morality p- uh, police center, which is called Wazara in Tehran, uh, to re-educate her, which is something ridiculous to start with because Mahsa, she was 22 years old. So she was born in the year 2000. She grew up under the Islamic Republic. She went to primary school in the Islamic Republic. She went to high school in the Islamic Republic. So she had the, they had the plenty of time to educate her. And they took her to this education center, Wazara, and on the way there, we do not know exactly what happened, but we know that she was beaten and then she unfortunately went to coma. And, you know, for young Iranians, Mahsa's age and younger, Mahsa, they could see themselves as potential Mahsa's. She was going through, she went through what they could go through every day. They can be arrested by the morality police. They can be dismissed from their school, their work because of their hijab. And anyone, any police officer, any revolutionary guard, any member of the paramilitary uh, besiege force can harass any young woman, any young woman, especially, or any young man they choose. And as a result, you saw this revolt, which really is a women's revolution in Iran and started by young women. And the average age of the protesters in Iran is between the ages 16 and 22. So it's a very young generation. This is a generation that has no idea about the ideals of the revolution. It has no idea of the eight-year war in Iraq, with Iraq between 1980 to 1988. They do not even have that much of a memory of the 2009 Green Movement when I was arrested. So this is a generation that really wants to have change and they want to have the change now. What is very interesting about this set of protests is that they do not chant for any particular specific group one way or another. They do not chant for the previous regime. They do not chant for some of the opposition group. They do not chant the name of any particular personality. There are, they have two main slogans. One is that death to the dictator, death to Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran. And the other, the main slogan is woman, life, freedom meaning that these young protesters, they want women to be respected in Iran. They want the sanctity of life to be respected in Iran, meaning that they do not want their lives to be in the hands of these aging mullahs and aging revolutionary guards, and they want freedom. How did the regime initially react to the protest? How has it been uh, attempting to quell them over the past month? And is it doing any good or is it just fueling more resistance? Well, the regime, they think that they have learned something from the Shah's demise and the way that Shah was toppled in uh, 1979. 
So when the protest, the uh, Islamic Revolution, uh, Revolution protest started in September 1978, in November 1979, Shah, the Shah of Iran, went on television. He apologized to people and he said that he had uh, heard the voice of the people. He made some reforms. He imprisoned some of his ministers. And four months later, he was toppled and Ayatollah Khomeini came to power. So this regime, the Islamic regime, which is led by the people who were revolutionaries in 1978, 1979, they think that if they have any kind of reforms in the system, that will lead to their demise. So they have responded to the, to the news of Mahsa Amini's death as rigidly as possible. They denied any kind of involvement in her death. They fabricated some medical history for her. They forced her family to confess on television that she was ill. And then after a couple of days, her father denied that uh, she was ill. And her, uh, the family's lawyer says that the family, they're under pressure to confess uh, against their will. And since then, they have brutalized people. They have killed hundreds of protesters. They have arrested thousands of young people across Iran. They have even tear-gassed primary schools. And we had some news of schools across Iran being raided and high school students taken to custody, into custody. The news of at least one high school student in the city of Ardabil dying as a result of beating by the... Besiege members, these are the paramilitary uh, force, which is a part of the Revolutionary Guards. So they have responded the way that they know how to respond, and they think that they can quell the uh, protest by brutalizing people. And they may be successful this time around. I don't know how long these protests are going to last. The young, brave protesters, they have surprised everyone with their energy and their zeal for change. But the regime is a very powerful regime and they might be able to stop this protest for a short time. But then something like Massa's death can happen in two months time, in one year time. And again, people come to the streets, you know, they have stopped having spectators in football matches. In one month's time, Iranian football team will take part in the Football World Cup in Qatar, and people will get around, so the regime has to worry about that. And they're going to uh, spend all their resources in order to establish what they call security. And and we know uh, from history that when regimes dedicate all their resources to fight against their own people, they eventually fall. We had uh, the military dictatorship in Poland in 1981. There was a military rule. And it just took eight years for the Polish dictatorship to fall. I don't think it's going to take eight years for the Islamic Republic to fall. This, this, I'm not sure what is going to happen to this set of, this set of protests, but this is the beginning of the end of the Islamic Republic as we know it. As that takes shape, what has the global community done in response to the crackdowns from the regime. I know here in Canada, uh, we saw the government classify the Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization, uh, ban its members from entering our country. Is that enough? Are there other things the global community should be doing to perhaps hasten the downfall of this regime? Well, I don't think that there is such a thing as global community, because if you have China and Russia as part of the global community, they are working with the Iranian people to suppress Iranians. And Iran is, of course, helping Russians with their drones to fight against the Ukrainian people. But I think the Western democracies and democratic people around the world, they can uh, get to be in touch with their representatives. They can think about establishing means of communications for Iranians. One of the main things that the Iranians need at the moment is a free flow of information, whether that can happen with, that can happen with VPNs, the virtual 
networks, or it can happen with satellite technology, the way that Elon Musk and Starlink, uh, they're, they're developing this satellite technology. I think that is one of the main needs. At the same time, there has to be targeted sanctions against people who've been brutalized, Iranians, and from what we know, uh, many of the regime insiders, they are sending their money and they're sending their children outside. Canada is one of the main uh, destinations for many of these people. And I don't think that the Canadian government has done a very good job monitoring the dirty money coming from Iran into Canada. There are, if you talk to any Iranian in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, or Calgary, they tell you that they know so many regime insiders who are investing in real estate, they are buying businesses. And I'm sure that the Canadian government knows that as well. But I don't think that they've had the will to fight against them. There's uh, there's a law that Canada has also signed, the Magnitsky Law, that's uh, named after a Russian lawyer who was killed by Putin. And it initially started as a way to curb the ability of the Russian oligarchs to invest their dirty money outside of Russia. But it also now includes Iran and many and some other countries. So I think there is a lot that can be done. And I think uh, to just show solidarity for uh, citizens of democratic countries as well, that's very important. And I think the Iranian uh, community in the diaspora, they have to learn that they are living in democracies and they have uh, the right to vote and they have the right to demonstrate. We saw a big demonstration of Iranian uh, diaspora all around the world. 50,000 people came to the streets in Toronto two weeks ago, and there will be another big demonstration on the 22nd of October in Berlin. So I think those are all very necessary steps, but I think the Canadian government and other Western democracies, they should just put their money where the mouth is. And if they're imposing sanctions, they have to really follow it through with enough bureaucrats, with enough willpower in order to create change. Otherwise, just uh, talking in the parliament and condemning this or that individual or groups of people is not going to work. As this continues, and maybe even over the past few weeks, how difficult has it been? You mentioned this uh, a minute ago, just to get accurate information on the ground in various places in Iran, because I know these protests are, are in many cities across the country. Um, your colleagues at Iran Wire, how, how have they been doing? Is it dangerous to report? And, and how strictly is the regime cracking down on, on trying to keep information in the country? It's been very difficult. It's been extremely difficult. Iran traditionally, uh, since the beginning of the revolution, even before the revolution, has been one of the biggest jailers of journalists around the world. But in the last one month, at least 50 journalists, professional journalists, have been imprisoned in Iran. And the regime, after uh, the Green Movement in 2009, has made information as a concept an enemy of the state. So as my interrogated, as my interrogator articulated, spies gather information and sell information in order to make a living. Journalists gather information and sell information in order to make a living. So journalists are spies. So that, that's a very simple logic that permeates through the regime. And that's the, the regard to journalists. And as a result, they have tried to curb this free flow of information in any which way they can. To start with, as soon as the protest started, they called different editors and publishers of different publications and websites, telling them not to publish anything about Massa. Then they started to arrest several journalists. They interrogated several journalists and they did not detain or arrest them. And they have narrowed the internet bandwidth in many places. 
And in some places like the Kur- like Kurdistan, people do not even have access to landline in many cases in order not to be able to send. And this is all uh, results. Uh, this all results into loss of income for the state itself. Uh, in 2019, the state uh, shut down the internet for three days, and according to some estimates, Iran lost 1.4 billion dollars as a result of internet shutdown. And this has happened in the past. You know, in one month, no one knows what is going to, uh, what is the cost to the state itself and to the to people. And people must have lost billions of dollars in their businesses, which have been on Instagram, on WhatsApp. Uh, There are at least about 40,000 Iranians who have businesses on Instagram. They're selling different things, you know, a lot all around the world, and they're losing a lot of money because of that, and the state is doing it. But they are doing all that because they think that it's necessary to save the system, to salvage the Islamic Republic. The last thing I want to ask you about is what happens next? I know you said this is the beginning of the end for this regime. What does that look like? I guess I'm wondering, like, is there a tipping point at which point it becomes impossible for the regime to stay in power? And and what would that even look like uh, compared to what we see on the streets right now, which obviously is is an impressive uh, display of protest? So I'm going to tell you that I do not know. I have been surprised by what has happening so far. I did not expect these protests to last this long. I did not have enough trust, maybe, in young people of Iran. I did not maybe have the enough knowledge about young people of Iran to know that they could persist for such a long time. And I can assure you that whoever tells you something with certainty is bullshitting you. No one knows what is going to happen in Iran in the near future. We have all been surprised. And when you talk to people inside Iran as well, as we do on a regular basis, I was talking to a couple of friends of mine half an hour before this conversation, and they were both surprised. And they were telling people, they were telling me that even the young people themselves, they're surprised by the solidarity shown among uh, people. So we do not know what is going to happen. But we know that the situation is not tenable. The situation is going to change, whether that change comes within a few weeks, within a few months or years, we do not know. But this is the beginning of the end of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mazir, thank you so much for this. And uh, I'm glad you're safe. And, and I hope your team at Iran Wire uh, stays safe and, and gets the information out. Thank you. Mazir Bahari, an Iranian-Canadian journalist and filmmaker and editor of IranWire.com. That was The Big Story. You can find more at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can obviously send us some feedback, suggest some topics. I want to give a huge thank you to the people who suggested that we cover Iran. We often try to keep our stories Canadian. However, sometimes, as with the war in Ukraine, one story impacts the entire world. You can find The Big Story wherever you get your podcasts. You can rate it and review it when you do. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.